Welcome to episode 70 of the Women of the Military podcast. This week, I'm interviewing Major General Mary Eater. She served in the Army for over 36 years and is now a renowned speaker, author, and a thought leader on strategic communication and leadership. She is the former commanding general of the U.S. Army Reserve Joint and Special Troops Force Support Command, former Deputy Chief of the Army Reserves, and former Deputy of the Public Affairs for the U.S. Army. She was the closing keynote speaker at WIND Summit 2018 and recipient of the 2018 Trailblazer Award. General Eater is the author of Leading the Narrative, The Case for Strategic Communication, and out soon her new book is titled Step Out of Line, Ladies, Stories of Courage, Sacrifice, and Grit, the women of World War II. Today we talked about her career in the military and one of the things that we focused on was the importance of networking, mentorship, and building relationship with your peers. I'm excited to share her story with you on this episode of Women of the Military podcast. So let's get started. You are listening to the Women of the Military podcast, where we share the stories of female service members and how the military touched their lives. I'm your host, military veteran, military spouse, and mom, Amanda Huffman. My goal is to find the heart of the story and uncover issues women face while serving in the military. If you want to be encouraged by the stories of military women and be inspired to change the world, keep tuned for this latest episode of Women of the Military. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here. Ah, It's great to be here. Why did you decide to join the military? I think originally I joined the Army like many people do, and it's called, I need to find a way out of a small town, and I need (laughs) to challenge myself and do other things. All of understanding what the military service really means came to me much later. At first, it was just about trying to find a way to scramble up that mountaintop and get a toehold and get started. Where are you originally from? I'm from Stoneboro, Pennsylvania, which is a small town, probably about 60 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's a rural area, a farming area. And, you know, you hear people say, well, in my town, we only had one stoplight. We didn't have a stoplight. (laughs) Did you have a stop sign? Yes. (laughs) You had a stop sign. So a small town. That's like the town my husband grew up in. It's really tiny. It doesn't have a stoplight. (laughs) Yeah, and and it's kind of changed over the past, I think, 20, 30 years. It's it's a little bit off the beaten path. So the people who know about it are the people who live there or are from there or are around there. How did you end up joining the military? Did you become an officer right away? I did. At that time, they had a program called Direct Commission. So you could direct commission into what was the Women's Army Corps, a holdover from World War II. So I was direct commissioned after I'd received my master's degree in English from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. There still is a direct commission program today, but it's primarily in the medical arena and also in cyber warfare. When you direct commission, what is the next step after you commission? Do you go straight to tech school, or is there a period of time where they're like training you to do military stuff? Well, if you think about people who join ROTC and then commission, or even those who enlist and raise your hand and the next day you're in the Army or Air Force or Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, you have to go to a basic course. And there was a basic course for this, too, okay. because you can't have a bunch of second lieutenants running around knowing nothing. <laughs> so it was everything from how to march and salute and behave, I think, and basic military history, uh, the physical training parts of it. All of those things you need to know at least enough about before you go to the, the tech school from there. And then what was your job in the Army? At first, the Army put me into the Signal Corps. I wanted to be in what was public affairs, public relations, and that wasn't possible somehow. Uh, It was a non-accession specialty. You had to wait until you were at least a captain and have operational experience before you could go to that. It's not that way in the Air Force for officers. Officers can go in as lieutenants. So I had to do something else first. The closest thing would have been Signal Corps 
broadcasting, but they put me in Signal Corps Electronics. So I went to the basic course with people with degrees in electronics engineering, and I'm still trying to figure out the positive and negative ends of a battery. So that was, that was difficult. So a couple of years later, I transitioned out very quickly because I had been working in a basic training unit as a training officer. And I moved to military police, which was much more understandable for me, non-technical specialty. And then at about the captain grade, I was able to move into public affairs. And that's where I stayed, although I did have some other military police assignment. My last one was as a battalion commander. When did you become a captain? Was it four years? It was four years. After that, I left active duty. Okay. And you went to the reserve. Why did you make the switch from active duty to reserves? I really didn't enjoy the active army at that time. This is the army after Vietnam, the hollow army of the early 80s. It was a difficult time to be in the military then, at least for me. I wanted to get into the public affairs arena. I was not enjoying being in a military police battalion. And so I transitioned. But even as I left, I knew that I would miss my friends. I would miss camaraderie, uh, army life, and I did. So a couple of years later, I joined the reserve. And I loved the reserve. I got to meet some amazing people from all over. And while I worked in the reserves in both Europe and in Virginia, I had great experiences with the people I met. I was fascinated with learning about what it's like to be a high school teacher in Roanoke, Virginia, or the city prosecutor or Winchester. So I had lots of experiences in learning about other lives and other people's ways to process how they're moving through life and what they're doing. So it was fascinating to me. It made me a better writer. So you left active duty and you didn't switch automatically to the reserves. So you left altogether. And what did you do as a civilian? Like, what job did you do? Did you get in the public affairs <clears throat> I arena? Did. It was easier that way. I got into public affairs. That was at Fort Lee, Virginia. I worked in public affairs there. And by the time I got into public affairs in the reserves, it was because of my civilian time that helped me make that transition. So I was able to then work throughout the remainder of my career, having both jobs help each other. You know, things I would learn in the reserves, I could take to my civilian job and vice versa. That's really cool. Did you ever have any like trouble like balancing having a civilian job and then also doing the reserves component because from people I've talked to, it's not always just one week in a month. There's a lot more to it. And even if it is that one week in a month, you sometimes work like a bunch of days in a row without some time off. It is difficult. And it's difficult for everybody, I think. One of the things that helped me was after I was in a civilian position for a number of years, I was better at balancing because I knew exactly what was expected of me in the civilian job, so I could modulate it to focus a little bit more on the reserve job if it required it, or if the civilian job required it, I could focus less on the reserve. So it was, it's a, always a balancing act, and it's never easy, and especially if you have to do schools. Right, because then you have to go <clears throat> essentially active duty to get your schooling done, and then how does that work with your civilian job? Sometimes you have bosses who are not particularly pleased that you're gone again. And I had some struggle with that. But of course, it is the law about supporting reservists in their time away. I'll tell you, too, that some of the jobs mean that you do some of the schoolwork at home and at night. So by the time I got to do the Army War College, that meant from the distance education perspective that I did a lot of the paperwork for 10 segments, 10 less throughout the year. And then you do two weeks active at Carlisle Barracks where the Army War College is. And then there's a second year of more of this. So you have your reserve job, your active job, and then, well, that one is every weekend trying to write papers for the school you go to. It is very challenging. I was very glad when it was over. My husband, a couple of years ago, had to go to the major course that he had, oh, and he had to... Staff. And it was like every weekend he was working on it. And I was like, I just want this to be over because like you said, it's a lot of work and like he couldn't do it at work. So he had to do it in the evenings and on the weekends. And it took a lot of time. I finally learned that if you did the papers early, you would get a two week break before the pain started again. <laughs> so I would look forward to that two week break. And I always said that when it was over, I would burn all the books. <laughs> But there were too many of them, so I took the course syllabus and I burned it. <laughs> I 
I love that. What steps led you to become a general officer? I think I was surprised when that happened. I wasn't expecting it. I'd only been, my goal was to become a colonel. And when I achieved that, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed brigade command. I commanded a training organization. And I was done with the war college, so that was all good. <laughs> and so I was actually in, really enjoying the time I was happy. Also felt that I finally had some time where I wasn't too closely supervised as a commander, so I could have a little flexibility in how I approached my organization, because we're so spread out. You know, reserve units are in many states sometimes, and so the division headquarters is very spread out too and has a great span of control. So I enjoyed that, and I wasn't expecting to be selected. Sure, that's something everybody dreams about, but it, that to have it actually happen was more frightening at that time than anything else. This can't be real. Oh, my goodness. I don't know anybody. I don't know how to do this. So it was a shock to me. So when you found out, did you know that you were going to go back on active duty, or like, is that a requirement, or how did that all work? Well, I was a colonel. In Germany. I was living and working in Germany then at the George C. Marshall Center, which teaches the principles of democracy to civilian and military officials from the former Soviet countries. So I was teaching the role of a free press in a democracy and also doing the public relations work for the organization. I love that job. And when 9-11 happened, people would ask me, do you think you'll be put back on active duty? And I said, no, nah, I'm too old. And I'm too high up. That won't happen. It took two weeks. And I was back on active duty at the U.S. European Command headquarters for about four months. And they ran out of money and sent us all back. Well, by that time, my job had been filled because they didn't know how long I would be gone. It could have been two years. Right. So I had to come back to the state, sadly, and came back to the Washington area and was then on active duty again for another short stint with DOD. So it continued. So even after I was selected for promotion, I was on active duty as the Army's Deputy Chief of Public Affairs for the next three years. Now, that's, that was the dream job, the one I'd always wanted, not necessarily to be the Deputy Chief, but just to be there. Although in the days after 9-11, it was probably more stressful and hectic than I could have imagined beforehand. So there's a lot of coping that went on with that. I haven't really thought about how much the military as a whole, reservists, National Guard, everybody was affected by September 11th happening, and it's changed the military into what it is today. And so that's really interesting. It changed everything, I think, for everyone associated with the military. It changed everything. It changed all of our training, all of our equipment. It made us realize how things we had that were still legacy, even from World War II, just don't work. So it changed everything, I think, for how we, we train. We train together, the active and reserve, for where our assets are located. You know, units have helicopters. Do we have the right balance of aviation with naval capabilities? So it, to me, it changed every single thing. Perhaps administratively, some of that and those regulations took a long time to catch up. But you probably remember when we had all of the issues with helmets. Do we have the right helmet? We have to change from the M16 rifle to the M4 because it's too difficult to get the barrel out the window of a Humvee, or before we even had Humvee. So it changed everything. It was just such a rapid pace for those years in determining what we would do and what we would do next. Yeah, when I deployed, it was 2010, and we trained in Humvees, and then when we were overseas, we were in MRAPs, and I had no idea, just because I didn't know anything about the military, that people were actually, like, fighting the war in Humvees, and that was like how it started. And it just blew my mind talking to people and seeing like how much change happened in such a short period of time. Mm. And, and even between 2010 and now, even more things have changed, and it's just a rapid evolving changing, and the military is just... You know, it takes 18 months for everything to change in total, except for the ugly uniforms, which seem to take much longer. <laughs> But everything in training, even if you were to tell people in, if you went in 2010 and you were to tell people in 2012, this is what it would like be like, it's totally different for them. Yeah, it's so true. I talked to someone who went to Bagram in 2013 and I went in 2010 and she said they got rocketed like every day and we never really got rocketed, like maybe once a month. 
at Bagram, and mm-hmm. then I was at a fob most of the time. But it like the whole the war changed, the technology changed, just how they fought the war changed. Like it was everything was like you said. What I would tell her wouldn't have been even close to correct because everything had changed. And yeah, and that was I left at the end of 2010, and then she was there in 2013. So two years later, and everything was different. So. Do you have any favorite memories from your time in the military? It can either be reserves or active duty. I have lots of favorites and and lots of favorite groups of people and friends and colleagues. I always look forward to seeing them because that's the one thing about leaving it is you miss your friends. My last job in the Army was to command a new unit that was standing up. More of that change. So this was a unit that was going to have all of the low-density, highly technical specialties in the Army Reserve. So I had all of the attorneys in the new unit. So I had 1,875 attorneys. I had all of the cyber units, the information ops units, homeland defense. And so some very technical specialties. And they tried to teach me a little bit of what they were doing in the cyber realm, just so I could help with how the Army was looking at setting up different units and where they should be located and should this even be a branch. So some of that is not only difficult technically, but also it becomes political. But I learned quite a bit from being around every one of those groups, and they all taught me so much that I didn't know before. I, they said, if once we tell you what we do, you'll never use a credit card online again. Really? That's kind of scary. But they do amazing things. And, and again, I'm always fascinated by what people get to do. Tell you, I got to go speak at places, too. So you get better at speaking, I think, because you have to do it so much. And I was asked to go speak at the the commissioning ceremony at Johns Hopkins University. This is a school I could have never gotten into, you know, when I was 18. I could have never gotten into that school. So I was just amazed at the opportunity and grateful to be able to do something like that. Yeah, I feel like the military opens doors that you didn't even know you could get close to, let alone walk through, just because of the things that you learn on your time in the military and just the people that you get connected to and like you said doing speeches and learning how to become a good speaker and all that sort of stuff can lead to new things that you didn't ever expect to have to or get to do yeah i think the biggest thing that i learned was you have to have a sense of humor you really do you have to be able to laugh at yourself and laugh at situation because it gets you through the tougher times and it puts things in perspective and makes them seem more reasonable You know, I did so much flying, you know, and I'm not, I don't like to fly very much, but I found out afterwards that if you fly in uniform, I would be in the airport and people would come up and hug me, which was just an odd experience. It's like people come up and touch your kids, you know, when you have babies. Right. Don't do that. (laughs) So people would come up and hug me and try to buy me drinks, and I I can't drink anything in uniform. Then they would be hurt, and it was just an interesting experience. So I had one run through the, the Chicago airport where I was late with a connection, and I made it onto the plane. They shut the door, and I'm all the way in the back, as usual. And the, then the announcement comes on that there's something wrong with the plane, and it won't take off for another 45 minutes. And I looked at the flight attendant and said, so can I order a pizza and have it delivered here? No. I said, so what do you have to eat? I'm hungry. It wasn't a flight where they had any food. And it was only, I'm sure, because I was in uniform, they went and scrounged for me a pack of crackers, two bananas, and a little container of Baileys, which, of course, I couldn't have. So I had two bananas and some crackers and a bag of peanuts for lunch. But it was funny, you know, and I found out afterwards, and when I speak to flight attendants, they don't answer. They would always talk to me because I was in uniform. And so I found that change to be, oh, I'm not not special anymore. You know what I mean with that? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I've written a few times about is about when you're in the military, people see you and you stand out because you're a woman in the uniform and not very many women. More women are serving, but not very many women serve. And then when you leave, you become invisible and like people don't acknowledge you for like anything. It's yeah, it's a huge It's a huge change. So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But, you know, you still project that. You still project in how you carry yourself and how you walk. Um, I have friends who say, would you stop marching when we go anywhere? No, this is just how I walk. (laughs) We're going to slow down. 
oh, I didn't know I was going too fast. So you still project this and you still are and always will be someone who has served and that is part of you forever. Yeah, someone once told me, they were like, something's different about you. What's different about you? And I was like, oh, I served in the military. And they were like, oh, I knew there was something. I just couldn't yeah. figure out what it was. And so it kind of surprised me because they were just like, what's it's different about confidence? Confidence is what shows. And you know, still, it's only less than 1% of Americans who do serve. So you are an anomaly in many ways. Now, certainly when I go back to my hometown, was back there last year to go visit my high school. I'm probably the only one in my class who served for some, did serve for a couple of years, but who stayed and who stayed longer. Mm -hmm. So, and they all look at me like, well, we never thought you would be <laughs> something like that. We never thought you would, I think, make anything of yourself to that extent would be what they'd say. Because we were all just basically rural farm kids. And I suppose at that time I would have been voted least likely to succeed at anything. But it, you learn how to drive your and how to schedule yourself. And like you said, your husband was his having to do the studying on weekends and at nights and still balance family in there, too. It's not easy. Right. But there's nothing like being in the military for teaching you, A, how much or how little sleep you can get by on, <laughs> and B, how you do time management and how you prioritize. And again, like I said, how you modulate, go back and forth between competing requirements and how you get stuff done. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about why you decided to leave the military and transition out. Well, I ran out of time. They said, sorry, <laughs> you're done now. So I stayed 36 years in the Army Reserve. There was only one three-star position. So it, I always said it was kind of like that old show Highlander. You know, in the end, there can be only one. And you run out of time. It's called you've had the maximum amount of time. You, it's time for you to go. If you don't leave, somebody else can't move up. And I think for many people who have a full career, there's that time frame between year 12 and 16 where you go, oh, when will this end? <laughs> How much longer do I need to do this? I want to leave now. And by the time they actually get to leave after 25 or more years, it's, I don't want to go. I like it too much. But there's, it was George Marshall who said, I don't want any 60-year-old generals. They don't take risks. So you have to move so other people can move up, and so things can change. That's very true. That makes a lot of sense. And it's kind of funny you said that because my husband and I, he's at the, like, 13-ish year point, and we're both like, okay, <laughs> we're ready to be done, but we're almost there. And so it's funny that you mentioned right in that window, and then mm -hmm. the next thing you know, mm -hmm. we'll be like, wait, we're not ready to get out. But it's just, Yeah. Yeah, and the Army has just changed its uniform again, so now now you're dated. Now, if I go anywhere wearing a uniform, I'm not wearing the current one. All right. But, you know, I would come back for that bomber jacket, I swear. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So what was your transition out of the military like? I had a change of command ceremony. My headquarters was in Salt Lake. So my 26 subordinate commanders, who were all colonels, were there with representations of their units. So we did the full-on ceremony with the firing battery, the band, and then I drove away. And I think that there's Colin Powell has a great saying about that. He said, don't look in the rearview mirror and don't complain about how things change after you leave it. You've, all, you've done everything you can and you have to go. So I left that and I had a retirement ceremony a few weeks later. By then, I had the flu, so I was pretty much out of it for the day of that retirement ceremony, but, and I was sick for the next couple of weeks, but I think a lot of that is realizing you have reached the finish line. Um, I know many people who sleep, who will sleep for about a month or more after they retire because the stress is done, and certainly you work all the way up to the last minute with the things that have to be completed. I called it skidding off the end of the runway, so the way I retired was... I didn't plan far ahead. I didn't ease into a transition. I skidded off the end of the runway and then woke up and said, what happened? <laughs> so getting used to being retired takes a long time. I've known people who say it takes four to five years before you really accept that change in where you are and what is next. I don't know that if anybody told me that, I would have believed it. Like, no, I'll be fine, really. This is no problem. But, you know, we're all a little tougher now. Not, no, I know the dog bit me, but that wasn't a big hole in my arm. Really. 
I can do this. I'm tough. So, but it does take a while. And it takes a while to discover who you are without it and what you want to be. And what I've always wanted to be was a writer. So I'm going to write now and write books. Well, that is not exactly an easy transition. But I didn't want to be what so many of my peers were, which is going directly into working for a contractor of some kind and basically just changing the clothes but not changing anything else. So I've been working very hard to find my voice with that. I've written some thriller novels and I do have an agent who is working very hard to find a publisher for because it's a series. I've written a non-fiction book with a fiction piece added to it. Carry the story of a little known World War II Russian general who was captured by the Germans and fought for them and supposedly buried some hidden Nazi gold somewhere in Germany. That was a big story when I lived, so I knew the places, and I knew where it was supposedly hidden. And, you know, one day, if you don't see me, I'm on a plane with a shovel, and I'm going back over there to look for it. <laughs> so I have that story, and I have a new one I'm working on, too. Yeah, I, I think that's really a good point. I want to go back to the four to five years, because I was in for six years, and then I transitioned, and so I've been ab- out about six years since... I left and it really did take me four to five years to refine myself. And so I think that's a normal thing for everyone who transitions, especially if you don't go to like that contractor type job, if you like do something totally different, like my degree is in civil engineering and now I'm a writer and podcaster, which is like, how do those go together? And so that that's really good. But I want to hear more about your book that you're working on right now. Okay, but first I'll tell you, I think as a civil engineer, you are very much focused on process. I am very much focused on process. You're right. (laughs) So as you came to this, you analyzed it, you studied it, you made a plan for it, you wrote the plan out, you trained yourself, you found out everything you could, and then when you launched it, there were no surprises, or very few, because you you were totally prepared. Yeah. Isn't that right? That is true. There's still a lot of learning to do, but yes, that... That is my, you nailed it. That's <laughs> the way I am. And I bet your house runs just perfectly too, you know, with, you might yeah, not sort think of. so, you might not <laughs> think so, but it does. Yeah, we have a system. It's just that we have children and they, they're a little crazy, but. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the, uh, the part of it you can't take into account for. Right. So, well, there goes the schedule for today. Yeah. Now I have to go do this and pick pick one of them up from school and everything else goes out the window. But because you have a plan, you're able to let things happen. That's so true. Okay, so what I'm working on now is just something that's grown with me as an idea over the past couple of years. I started with a book I got when I retired. One of my former commanders gave me this book called The Women of War- the Civil War, a historical book, because he thought it would be a good gift to give somebody a history book. And so this book was published in like 1866, and it's about the hundreds of women who served in the Civil War. I was blown away by that because I really didn't know there were that many. And in the foreword to the book, the author says, well, there's actually thousands, and we just don't know about all of that. So these are vignette stories of women who served, who went with their husbands or picked up a gun or started to help out in the camp. And then ended up fighting or doing some other type of support activity, whether it was bringing forth rations or ammunition. And I didn't know they existed. I only knew about a couple of women who had been in the Civil War. So I was fascinated with that. Then a couple of years ago, I learned about this book called The Hello Girls, about the 223 women who were in World War I in the Army. They were telephone operators. Now, by then, all the other services had started to recruit women mostly as nurses and some admin specialists, but these women were on the front line. And in order to get there, they also had to be able to speak French. And it was General Pershing who directed they be recruited because men were too slow at connecting phone calls. It would take them a minute, and it took the women 10 seconds. So they were they were pulled after the war. They were not veterans. They'd never really been in the army. And it was a 60-year fight to get them recognition. So now I'm fascinated with this story. And then last year, I picked up a book called Code Girls by a former Washington Post reporter. And this is about the women in Washington who were code breakers in World War II. There were 10,000 of them. That was just amazes me to think of. There were something like 6,000 Navy women in downtown D.C. They worked out of the building that is now DHS. 
and 4,000 Army women who worked in the area at Arlington Hall Station, which is now where the National Guard headquarters is. I actually think you could do a great World War II tour of D.C., just saying. But I'm fascinated with these stories of super achievers who I don't know anything about come to today, and I want to write about some of them. And I've started reading obituaries of World War II women who are all in their late 90s now. And when they die, there's big stories about what they did. The spies, the code breakers, the ones who saved people from the camps, and the ones who survived the camps. And what fascinates me about their stories is the impact of what they did and how, for the most part, they were alone or isolated or constricted by the security of what they did. One of the Navy code breakers said she was afraid to go to sleep because she might talk in her sleep, and they never talked. It's just last year they had their first reunion. It's not only their story, it's how they've impacted all of us and how different things are for us because of them. Now, when you were in the Air Force and you went to Bagram, you weren't the only woman there, right? No, but I was attached to an infantry unit, which we weren't allowed to be in 2010. Right. And you think about all the doors that are open now and all the special. Right. And so what's different for us, among other things, is networking, the ability to network, and volume. There's more, more people, more women joining, more moving up, all female flight crews at Annapolis. There is now a women's uh, mentorship program. And up until three or four years ago, there weren't even enough women there to have Not yeah. in far as midshipmen, but in the staff and faculty. Yeah, so much change. It's so much positive change. It's amazing. It is. And as you said, with all the specialties now being open to women, more and more people are joining. And not, not to be first, not to make a point. They're just saying, well, I thought it was cool. My recruiter said I could blow things up, so I wanted to be an artillery. Okay, that's a better reason. <laughs> well, yeah, and I don't think women go in to be the first one. Even when I went and was attached to an infantry unit with the Army, even though I served in the Air Force, I didn't know, I didn't even really know there was a regulation that I wasn't supposed to be doing that or that it was kind of, I just did whatever the military told me to do. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I didn't think anything of it because... Because the military does a really good job. I'm glad they finally have changed the regulations, but I feel like they do a good job of being like, you're a person, do this. They don't look at sex, and now they really don't. But at the time, they were like, you're an engineer. We need an engineer. Go do this job. And so that's what I did. I think that's great. And it, as long as you remembered after, and I think that's what I found with so many of these stories. It was, well, that didn't count, or you're not really a veteran, or... There was an admiral who was asked after World War II, and he was testifying before Congress about the code breakers. And he said, I, well, I think all the men who, who were here did a magnificent job. Boom, and then it was just gone. And because they'd all signed agreements, they would never speak. The stories never came out. So I like telling these stories. And I mentioned to you earlier, I was at the Women's Memorial yesterday, where they're continuing to tell those stories and encourage women to register. And they've got a huge ambitious goal to get to the t first 25 years here of having more than a million registered because there's more than two million women veterans in the United States and, and what we find is people say well you know I didn't do that much I wasn't in for that long every every everybody counts and I right. think everybody makes a contribution and makes a difference yeah that's sometimes what I hear from women when I tell them about my podcast they're like oh that's really great but my story is not worth telling and I'm like no you have a story you need to tell it and it's kind of interesting how interesting their story is, even though they think that they don't have a story. I know. I think that is so true. Everybody has a story that is meaningful and can help inform, inspire you know, others. And so I think that's another reason that I'm so happy you do this because it's so important. And I would hope the Women's Memorial could promote what you're doing, too. I'm working to get connected with them. And so I know that I'm on their radar. We just have to connect and get everything figured out. But right. I think we can partner together and reach more women and tell more stories. And mm -hmm. I think what you're doing with the World War II veterans is really cool. I got to interview Erin Miller, and her grandmother was a mm -hmm. wasp during mm -hmm. World War II. And so her um, episode 50 on the podcast is just a fascinating story. And while I was reading her book about her experience, I was really upset, but also really excited because I didn't know the story of the wasp. And because of reading her story, I got to hear all about what the women had done and what they had to go through to become um, recognized as veterans. And then mm -hmm. after she died to get 
recognized to be buried at Arlington and all the things that they went through. And it was, it was eye opening. And so I think telling those stories is so important. Yeah, some of the stories of the spies are incredible. And many of them ended up working at the CIA or NSA after the war. One of them who uh, ended up with the CIA, was her name was Virginia Hall. And she had wanted so desperately to get to the work and intelligence, and she just couldn't get there. They wouldn't take her in. And this is a time in World War II where, you know, women were just overlooked. Mm -hmm. So she was in Europe trying to get into work with the OSS, and the French actually said they would hire her. And then she had a hunting accident and shot herself in the foot and had to have her leg amputated. So several years later, when she was running this huge spy network in France, Klaus Barbie, a Nazi war criminal later, was after her. He knew she was there and they couldn't get her. She escaped by going over the mountains in the dead of winter, dragging that 14-pound wooden leg through the snow. And when she got into Spain, they were, they kept her for a few days because she didn't have her passport stamp, but she'd escaped. And she ended up working for the CIA for years. Wow. Yeah. That's so awesome. I'm so excited about the work that you're doing and all the books that you're writing. And I can't wait to get a chance to read them and, and help you promote them so that more people can hear about them. But I have one last question for you. What would you tell girls who are considering joining the military? Go for it. Do enough research to know if you're right for the Air Force, if you're right for the Coast Guard, if you're right to go in the Army, which one offers you what will work for you. I'll say this about the Army is there's something there for everyone. If you want to be a cook, want to be a chef, go in the Army and they'll send you to a advanced schooling at some of the, and work with some of the best chefs in the nation. If you want to be a warrior, you'll be that no matter which service you go into. But each one has a culture, and each one of culture is different. So pick the one that fits you, that you think fits the way you like to work and how you get along with people, how you make decisions, and where you want to go. I would say go in the, go in the military. Go do something at the age of 18 or 19 that gives back. Have that as a gap year or two or three. You don't have to stay forever. Just go have the experience. Travel. Do something different. Challenge yourself. That's great advice. I think everyone can benefit from spending some time in the military. And I'm so thankful for the six years that I served and all the experiences that I have. And I think you're right. Just a few years and it, it'll change everything. I know that you can be a chef. I've interviewed a chef who served in the Coast Guard. She shared her experience on episode 18, if you want to check it out. But there are so many different things. You might not know all the different jobs that there are available for you in the military. And there is there is definitely a way for you to find one that you never even thought about. Like you never thought growing up you would have a podcast. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, because there weren't any then, but that's, you know, that's something else. So It's always there's changing. The, there's social media manager. You know, there's things that will exist tomorrow that don't exist now. The Army just now has its own gaming team to compete at on a national level for all, not just military games, but they compete in Fortnite and many of the others. Yeah, see all these opportunities I didn't even know about. That's crazy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and for being a guest on the podcast. I really enjoyed getting to hear your experience and all the different pieces of wisdom that you shared. Do you have anything else that you want to add before we wrap it up? I think that if people find your podcast, and I think they should be promoted to ROTC unit so that we have people who are looking at the very basics of what military life might be like going forward. If they delve into the stories that you're telling, they'll be able to see and understand more. And it's not quite so strange and so daunting and so scary to try something like this. You know, we all were six years old once and walked to that first day of school, which is probably the scariest thing ever. But once you get past that, you know you can do it and you can make friends. And once you have friends and you have colleagues and cohorts, it's so much better going forward. That's so true. Thank you so much. I really appreciated you being on the podcast and for all your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Women of the Military. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the amazing stories I have with women who have served in our military. Did you love the show? Don't forget to leave a review. Finally, if you are a woman who has served or is currently serving in the military, please email me at airmantomom at gmail.com so I can set you up to be on a future episode of Women of the Military. 